No, by name, I will forget him. He made me what I am. And he may be gone, memories linger on. I'm done. And I miss him. My own man. That was Finbar Fury singing about his father, Ted Fury. So who exactly was Ted Fury, his old man? My father walked um, for uh, Slater's Garage, which was in Kilmainham at the time. Big little bits and scraps, I remember. He became a qualified mechanic, but he went to uh, Puck Fair when he was 17 with Charlie Slater, who was a racing driver who got killed afterwards in a, in a crash. Anyway, they went down to the puck in a motorbike and sidecar, which was you couldn't, you wouldn't see them in them days. And my father was sitting in the sidecar, you know, and he had a, his fiddle with him, and off he went to puck fair anyway. Charlie Slater met up with uh, Jack Doyle, the actor. Yeah, anyway, he was very, very famous at the time in Ireland. And they met, met him a puck. So my father got the motorbike and sidecar to take back to Dublin. And Charlie Slater went off with um, Jack Doyle. So my father was, um, heard my mother singing, you know, standing and sing busking. And she was singing whatever, you know, whatever song, playing the banjo. And he started just, well, he couldn't get over. So he was one thing led to another. Find out where she lived and went up and met up with her parents and took her out and uh, had a chat and they played a few tunes together and hit it off. So I think when she saw the motorbike and sidecar, it was love at first sight, you know what I mean? <laughs> and they got married, I think, three days later in Castle Island. Oh, right. Three days and um, he put my mother into the sidecar and then took her back to Dublin right. and that was it, you know? His father played the flute. My father then played fiddle. His sister played fiddle. Uh, the, and their daughters, when eventually they played fiddle, they all mad to the fiddle and mandolin, you know. The Fury Boys, Finbar, Eddie, George and the late Paul, were introduced to Irish traditional music by their parents, Ted and Nora. They each mastered their respective instruments, tutored by their parents and serving demanding apprenticeships busking at Crow Park and other outdoor venues from an early age. All this found exquisite expression in the world-famous Fury Brothers and Davy Arthur. The Furies were one of a small number of traveller families who played Irish traditional music at open-air events, such as fairs and football matches. Because they were small in number, these families formed close bonds. They included the Keenans, the Dorans and the Dunns. John Keenan and his musical children lived close to the Furies in Ballyfermot. Finbar spent some time living with the Keenans so that he could learn ill and piping from John Keenan, who was also teaching his son Paddy at the same time. Finbar did live with us then for from the, the late fifties until the nineteen sixty six when they when they moved off for uh, were going to England and off to Scotland. And that's where they made the first album. Ted and my dad were the best of friends and uh, played music whenever, or they'd go off and busking and whatever else. There was a great Dunn family, you know, there was Hunter, and all of them years ago, they would have been only kids, the whole lot of them. And they all would have grown up together, you know, playing the music and meeting. And, of course, Johnny Dorden was a great part of my father's life as well because my father spent a lot of years on the road with Johnny, busking and travelling the road. Mickey Dunn is a renowned Ellen Piper and fiddle player who is committed to Irish traditional music and the Irish traveller style in particular. He's from a long line of Dunn family musicians who played throughout the Munster region over the last few centuries. Well, I come from a family, Tommy, that's, they were steeped in traditional Irish music, really. They were, they were known down around Munster as the Blind Dunn Brothers. My three uncles were blind. 
And they put, all my family played music on the street. That's how they made their living. Like for for going back to the eighteen hundreds, all my all my relations going back to as far as the famine were street musicians, fiddle players, and stuff like that. So music was huge, huge thing to me. It was more than just a, a hobby, Tommy. I mean, there was a way of living for them. That's how they survived. Like that, they had to play music. That's how they made their living. Other people did other things, but they, they concentrated on the traditional music. They, they would go to wherever there was anything happening, Tom. They would travel to fairs and to markets and to festivals and football matches and hurling matches. They would go where the crowd would be. That, that was the way they made their living. They were professional. Like, and like I mean, if the Munster final was in Limerick, they would be on the bridge. And geez, I often saw them playing there, like, and they had crowds of people around them, you know. And they would go to the Galway races and they would go, to, to, they would go up to Crow Park when there'd be matches and... There was a whole, you see, Tommy, some people go busking today and they play traditional music, it's a hobby. Mm-hmm. But these, these people, like, it was a way of life. It was a way, that was how they lived and they fed, they fed us, they fed our families, and that's the way we survived, do you know? He called into our house a few times, Tom, when I was growing up, and also, like, I remember Felix Doran calling to us in the 60s, if he was in around Limerick or anything, he would call to my father. They all knew each other well, like, and they all played together. But I remember Ted, Ted was, Ted, I remember Ted, do you know what I, I remember about him? He was a fierce, generous fella. Do you mm-hmm. know, do you know when you were a kid, he'd come to the house and he'd give us a few bob to go to the shop. So we thought he was God almighty, like we wouldn't have had it. Tom, times were tough. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? You wouldn't have had the money to go buying sweets and things like that. He, he, we used to always love to see him coming because he, he'd give you a few shillings to go down and buy things in the shop. Even. So we thought he was God Almighty, but by God, when they play Tommy, him and my father, the two fiddles, she's, it was a, it was a beautiful music, Do you know, lovely wildness and a lovely kind of different kind of different music to you hear normally. fiddle player Tommy he was a fiddle player that was way ahead of his time to be honest he could play anything like he could play a bit of classical music as well he could vary it up like my own my, you see Tommy when you're on the street you have to play it to the crowd do you know it's not everybody likes traditional music you know what I mean Ted and Nora settled in Ballyfermot and had four sons Finbar Eddie Paul and George the brothers were coached in the art of music making by both their parents. My mother would have started oh, yeah. Paul, you know. My mother played the, the melody, she was great. Mm. She was a smashing player and she used to do, um, there's one fair county in Ireland. Da, yeah. da, 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 da. That'd be one of the four children Paul would, would have learned, yeah. Yep. And she would play that on a accordion uh, and sing it, you know. Mm. And I remember Paul picking the accordion. Paul was a good singer with the box flute. I remember um, we all learned to play that piece of music on the box we could all play I could play it boys of the country yeah, man. Yeah, Eddie could play it <laughs> my man taught us that's what you know chewing on the box well aware of the opportunity to create a good living from playing Irish traditional music Ted gave his sons a great start in life by instilling in them the discipline of learning and practicing their trade and providing them with the best available instruments according to Finbar the house was always full of banjos fiddles accordions Whistles, guitars, and pipes. Eddie and I went with him in the beginning when we were kids. We were only about eight years old, seven or eight, and we busted with him. He, you know, and that was a great training for us when we were kids. You know, to bus with your he father. didn't. He didn't have to busk. He just went. He did it. You know, and he says, "Come on," and it got us to know the tunes and learn different tunes. You know. And he would be there with us, and we wouldn't stay with us. He'd leave us then and come back a half an hour later and mm. see that we're all right. And then we'd go home and count a few bob out and give the money to my mother anyway, you know. Mm-hmm. But, like, we would do that. Uh, Sunday, if there was a football match on, he'd go. He'd take us. And he would play for about half an hour, and then he would disappear, oh. and we'd come back and we'd play away from there. Until Eddie and I learned to do it on our own. Mm. We used to go then, and we enjoyed it, you know, because we're... We were making lots of money, me and him, you know. And there was a few half crowns hidden here and there, you know. We opened out the, 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 the torus upside down to get the grade out of us, you know. And it was great fun, you know. Like, but he was great. He said, "Right, that, you keep that, and you keep that." And it was the first real pocket money we ever had was when we were kids, mm. but we earned it, you know. And the rest was to pay rent and put food on the table, and that's the way we learned. And we, we had to, no ego whatsoever. I remember. 
standing at the beginning mm. of um, a crow park where you walk down the canal along there and there's a, there's a little pole, you'll see it there. I used to plant my arse on that pole mm. and take the pipes out. Mm. I was only a, a young kid at 12 years of age and I was playing a full set of pipes, you know. Mm. My father would be playing the fiddle and Eddie would be playing, he had a four string band, uh, guitar, which he would help along, it was mm. fabulous, you know. It was a lovely sound, you know. Eddie was a great fiddle player and he packed it in and Eddie bought a guitar and there was ructions in the house for a few weeks over this guitar hanging on the wall. And uh, by this time now, I mean, I was, Eddie was 21, you know, and mm -hmm. I was 19 and we were starting to really Go get first. packing our bags, we were leaving, you know. Yeah, we, we had itchy feet, we wanted to see the world. <laughs> and we were always very close, him and I, you know. Tommy Phelan grew up in Ballyfermot, close to the Furies. Ted and the young Tommy became close friends. He was a fantastic storyteller. He was a great musician. He was a showman. He was an entertainer. Uh, and he was just this mystery figure for us, you know, as kids growing up. It was like free concerts in, in, in his garden, you know. Ted then started taking interest as we were going by, and he'd be asking, what's in the box? And all that sort of thing, you know. And then we they would be sitting out in the garden there sometimes in the summer. Mm -hmm. Short off and tattoos here and there, and he might be making a bower on or repairing an instrument. And he'd sit down with it, and he was one of the greatest storytellers that I ever heard. Like you never could let the truth get in the way of a good story. <laughs> but he'd always stories with the tunes. He'd make you interested in the tunes, and I, I think he had a huge influence on the bias, and the bias had a huge influence on the whole traditional and folk world, you know. Ted could hold his, uh, his own anywhere. He, he, he was a gift, and he passed that gift on freely, you know. So we'd gone down to Clare with him, and I'd go to the Flas with him. And mm. As I said, he was a real showman. And we'd stop in the town, park up, and then I'd have to take my pipes out. And I'd pipe him in, and you know the big long beard he had? <laughs> yes, indeed. He's stroking that as he's walking down the street. And then he'd be waving to the crowd. They'd be leading him in like it was a procession. <laughs> Everyone knew Ted Fury was in town. Frank McNamara played banjo and fiddle in the back room of O'Donoghue's Merrion Road, Dublin, in the late 60s and early 70s. He played with Ted and his sons, Seamus Ennis, and other great musicians of the day. Frank was one of the early members of the Buskers, along with the late Paul Fury and Brendan Gleeson. I was impressed by his, his, by his fiddling and his, his repertoire of tunes. And um, Seth and Seamus used to kind of bang tunes off each other in the back room, different variations of the tunes. Uh, when I come back to Dublin, he'd have a, um, he'd have a piece of music uh, written out for me. Uh, mm -hmm. By hand, um, it's one of the one I have in my hand here. I'm reading it here. It's uh, by O'Carroll and a far lord in Ukraine, arranged by Ted Fury. When I saw him doing this out by hand, and it's uh, superb uh, workmanship. You swear it was done by a machine. It was, it's so perfect. But we, when <laughs> we didn't see him in doing it himself in Clatter Road. Mm -hmm. But he wrote at the back of each one, he wrote various notes about the tune. Uh, this, this one, Lord Inti Quinn, very well known tune. Yes, I know. Uh, yeah. the, the back of it. I can read it for you if you want to. Yeah. Yeah. He uh, says, This beautiful mel melody was composed by O'Carroll and dedicated to Lord Inti Quinn, whose place O'Carroll was invited to play for some guests. Torval O'Carroll was also well treated by his lordship. But before that, he left, he composed a lovely tune for the Lordship's honour, as far as I know. This is Ted's writing here. There were sessions on the team or big house nearly every night, and there was always a harper, piper, or fiddler uh, procured for these sessions. I always left with a handsome reward for their labours. Here's the kind of say it's just outside Newburgh and Fairs can declare, and it is named Inch, it's about two miles further towards Ennis. This is uh, correct to the best of my knowledge, signed Ted Fury. Uh, he was a character, to say the least, because he, he could he could tell stories that um, there was one particular uh, 
big we were playing and then she called in the folk club you know around 1970 his trick was, was uh, I know this tune so well I can play it backwards you know? <laughs> and everybody would say oh Ted you can play it backwards he <laughs> said yeah so he stands up and he's turning it back to the audience and playing the tune <laughs> That was that was the kind of a, a character he was. He uh, I think the tune was called Brian O'Lynn. Uh, some, a fiddler from the Kilfenora Pet Band came over one night. We were playing in a session, and um, it was kind of hard to believe the amount of tunes that they were playing. They were playing at three, three or four in the morning, <laughs> banging off each other with different tunes. You know, this one takes... Yeah. You know, that... Uh, but he, he could keep up with the, his repertoire of tunes. Uh, he could keep up with any of them. Ted and Nora had done their work well. The boys were now well prepared to play a leading role in the rise of Irish folk and traditional music at home and abroad. And Eddie was doing great. He formed a band called the Spartans. I mean, Eddie played in the cavern for a week, you know, in Liverpool. And you had to be invited to that, you know. He was just about to take off when Joe Haney walked into my life. Mm-hmm. And my father, we were in Dunahoo's, me, something, my father. And Joe came in and he just came back from Glasgow and he had to go down to um, Connemara. His brother wasn't well. And he handed me a 12 day tour of Scotland. Mm. He says, Will you do that? And I said, Well, you know, I, I'd never been out of Ireland before in my life, you know. And I'm going, Yeah, okay. So it's my father said, I said, I'll ask Eddie, does he want to go? I just thought it was just a session. I didn't think it was. It was a massive tour. <laughs> like when we were over, we, we couldn't believe it, you know. The place was packed. The Royal Hotel in Aberdeen was our first gig. They were hanging out of the walls to see this young piper because they'd already put in the paper. Yeah, yeah. and, um, and his brother singing. Eddie had a 12-string guitar. He was like an orchestra when he opened up, you know and then the full set of pipes, and then his voice, you know. But when we went to Scotland, coming back to Scotland in 67, to do Joe Heaney's tour, we didn't need any practice. We knew everything, like in love, you know, I know where I'm going. We had um, oh, the bunny bunch of roses, oh, we had the, the rocks of bonds. We can't be. I had all these melodies and slow airs mm. that I'd learned. I was piping like a lunatic, you know, I mean, the regulators were just hopping on my wrist, you know, and I used to play the, I learned a Scottish piece of music called the Bluebells of Scotland, and he hits the regulators and to play the regulars and play the chanter with the one hand and just keep you know like an and take off yeah I was over then Eddie come in to 12 string just sure. and then when he sang Eddie has a great voice I mean he's mm-hmm. as wild it's like it's just raw Beautiful you know voice, yeah. and when he sings there's nothing he's just straight out you know mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. and he had a real broad Dublin accent and boy, and Jesus, he cut through it like a knife, you know, yeah. what he's saying. Made it very distinctive. Himself and Luke Kelly now would have been great pals. We grew up together, you know, the mm-hmm. lads. You know, we met Luke when he was young. But he came over to Scotland with, when Eddie and I, we left in, I still remember, the 5th of February, 1967, mm-hmm. we left Ireland. And uh, we went away for two weeks tour, but we didn't come back for 10 years. So we we went to we went down to England, had a look at England, and mm-hmm. you know, and um, we met up with some great people, you know, like Martin Carthy, Dave Swarbrick. At the time, it was the whole folk revival was starting in 1967 in Britain, and we our base was in Edinburgh. What was we, the name of the pub? It was a famous pub. Yeah, uh, Sandy Bell's. That's it, yeah. And we met some extraordinary people. One in particular. And I often said there should be a monument put up to her, you know. And she was from Belfast. Her name was Diane Halley. And Diane had a commune house, which was musicians and artists. You know, you could stay there, you know. Mm. And we had a room, Eddie and I would have a room there, and she'd keep that for us. And, you know, you had Ewan McCall and Peggy Seeger stay there. 
Martin Carkey, Dave Swarby stayed there, the Dransfield stayed there, Robin and Barry. You had Alice Campbell would have stayed there, Hamish Himlock, all these amazing folk singers. So we had a whole big the Curries would spend the out they wouldn't they, they they had their own place. They were from Edinburgh. But and Roy had his house on Sterling Road, I was a member of Roy Williamson. And I remember Roy coming in one night and he was um Oh, he had a bottle of Bell's whiskey in one hand and a guitar in the other and I, I said come on I was 20 22 I think at the time 21 or 22 and he came in he says you have to hear this song I've just finished it and he sat on the floor of Castle Terrace which was um, run by Diane Halley mm-hmm. and sang Flower of Scotland for the first time oh. he'd just written it and he, we were we did support to the Corries there and we were a great band there was only two of them at the time the others had left it was Roy and Ronnie and uh, the two boys went on to Cali Cinema I remember in Edinburgh and they sang this song at the end of the night and it just the people just floored them and it just got bigger and bigger and bigger it's massive oh flower of Scotland when will I see Again, that fought and died for your weave, it's hill and glen that stood against them. Proud Edwards are and send them homeward to think again. We took him to Denmark, Eddie and I, at a big festival years and years ago. Would have been about 1968. Copenhagen was a big folk festival, but it was all Romanian musicians, Swedish musicians. It was a great mixture of trad music from different parts of Europe. And he hooked up with these Swedish fiddle players. Actually, it's and Danish fiddle players. I didn't even know these guys existed. And he'd bring them along and they'd, they'd come home to here to come back to Ireland. Yeah, we took Michael Russell, uh, Bobby Clancy, my father, and the Buskers, which was Aye. Paul, mm-hmm. uh, Badger, and Davy Arthur, who was actually with the Buskers at the time. Mm-hmm. There was no Fury Brothers in them days. It was just Eddie and I. Mm-hmm. And Eddie and I were absolutely... We took on the universities in Germany, Eddie and I, mm-hmm. which was a very wise decision because the Dubliners used to come in and do the hall. So the only two... Literally Irish bands that were playing out there was Eddie and I and the Dubliners. There was nobody else at what, the time. What year was this around? 1971, mm-hmm. 72. Okay. And um, in 1973, I'd say, we filled the Krona Hall in Munich, which is a whole 5,000 people. So I leave it to your imagination. We did it for a prestige for the, uh, the new album we do. And the album got album of the year, you know, a folk album. So that's a Finbar and Eddie one. Yeah, well, yeah. we made about eight or nine albums, Eddie did, uh, with myself. But when my father and uh, Michael and Bobby Clancy got together, the three of them on stage, they were magic, only magic. Mm-hmm. Um, Michael would play... A lovely style of playing it. And my father would play with the fiddle and Bobby would come on and play the bones. He was great with the bones, you know. And of course the Germans loved that. And then Bobby was singing our song, Shano was a great singer. Yeah, it was huge. It was massive. So Eddie and I were actually filling these halls on our own, you know, if we wanted to. And uh, we just did the one festival and then we pulled back mm-hmm. and we let the buskers take it then and my father. So they brought then Clannet uh, uh, over. Clannet oh, right. yeah. were only, I think Maya was only about 16 or 17 at the time. Maya and Clannet came over on the next tour and they just tore the place apart. Mm-hmm. The Germans then started to realise there is there's different types of music. Irish music, trad, mm. trad music. It's mm. all trad, but this beautiful Shannos. Different you know. interpretations. Of yeah. Mm. And then we brought a Shannos. My father brought a great Shannos singer as well from West Cork over. And um, he was a beautiful singer. And uh, 
that was massive festival as well. Mm. And then I think they did one more. That was it. Ted was very fond of Doolan and he, and he promoted Loved Doolan. Loved it. He did always, and we, so did we, and with Michael. And then, you know, we used to say, you have never lived till you've been to Doolan, you know. Mm-hmm. You have to go to Doolan. We used to say all the time, all the time. We formed the band in 1978. And by the time Sweet 16 came out, which was 1980, 81, you couldn't get a place, a seat in a pub in the west of Ireland with the Germans coming mm-hmm. in. And with the bought houses, all the Germans and everything, you know. But, you know, it was, then Clannard came over, they Dan and then were, came over the, at the next mm-hmm. year the tour, you know. And it, it was just took off, it was fantastic, and it was a great idea. So everybody got a piece of the cake, you know. Ted passed away in, in Dublin. He did. He, he, um, I was in Tübingen in Germany with my brothers and the band. We were doing a tour over there. And um, oh God, Sheila had phoned me up and said, your father died in Doolan tonight. And I said, oh, Jesus. And we cancelled everything. We flew home that night after the concert. We went straight to Frankfurt Airport and got a flight and came home to Dublin. It broke my heart. Was it a heart attack? An aneurysm, yeah. All oh, right. And um, yeah. he um, seemingly he was having a cup of tea in the bed in B where he was staying and the owner of the place so I went to pick up his bag the owner um, I asked him what happened and he said he just fell to his knees and he was dead before he hit the ground and I said oh okay he didn't suffer no yeah. he didn't And um, so I remember collecting his bag and they wanted to bury him in Doolan and I said no I'm taking him back to Dublin mm. and um, they took his bag and his stuff you know and uh, you know, mm. cried my eyes out for about a week and couldn't believe he was gone because he was only, he would have been only about 64 or 65, you know. But uh, he was an amazing, amazing character. cleaning up the, the upstairs house for my mother and uh, there was stuff in the attic that she wanted me to have a look at. There was fiddles and all sorts of stuff and it was breaking my heart to, to pick it all up and put it into a corner, you know. And uh, I found this book, which I hadn't seen for years. I remember him writing it when I was very young and it just said at the end of it, I went through it and there was all sorts of stuff in it and right at the end of it it just said it was some kind person please get this published after I'm gone. That's all it said, you know, and I went, well. And um, then it was lying there for years after that, and Anya, our daughter, decided to bring it into UCD. And when they brought it into UCD, she, you know, she they looked at it and they said, wow, then it goes back to 1920, 1922. And this is a whole history of fairs and where he picked up stuff and where he picked this music that he... He got off Johnny Dorn. He was lilted, and Johnny would or he, Johnny would lilt, and my father would write it, you know, or he'd play it, and my father would write it. And it's not just that, though. It, it really is so much more than that. Even the cover of the collection, the cover of the manuscript, it, it's a work of art in itself. Barbara Neilin, associate professor of folklore at the Irish Folklore Commission, University College Dublin, explains what the book was and how important it is to the Irish nation. Well, that was, to give it its full official title, Tommy, that was the Fury Collection Book of Irish Dance Music. And the work itself, I mean, it's clearly a labour of love. The uh, vital statistics, I suppose, on it are that's about 130 pages long, and it contains almost 200 tunes, and that wasn't even the complete and full repertoire. <laughs> important volume because it really is much more than just a collection of tunes. I mean, you know, the whole social history represented there, you know, that, that interaction between musicians, which is at the very heart of traditional music. Uh, you know, you, you had all of these collectors from, you know, bunting uh, in the early 19th century, 
you going back to the late 18th century and then all of the 19th century collectors of music. But this is actually a traditional musician collecting, you know, music from themselves and from their, their peers in terms of traditional music. So that does make it stand out and makes it a little bit news or, uh, unusual as well. He did it with a piece of, like a, a plastic, that he burned these little holes and it that would be for the, the size of the dots. The note itself. And then he would use the side, which was perfect. Just, yeah, and he had a little thing, and if you look at it, you think it was printed, you know. And I remember he would, you know, to save electricity years ago, he would light a couple of candles, you know, and he would sit down with the book, and we'd be off with the bed, and he'd stay, you know, you just maybe hear him going to up this coming up the stairs three hours later, or two hours later, he'd be writing, you know, mm. and he finished it, you know. Emmett Gill is a well-known Ellen Piper, an archivist with the Peabury Ellen. He reflects on the impact of Ted Fury and his family on mainstream Irish traditional music. Ted's own fiddle playing, I've, I would have always been aware of growing up. You know, he was he, he was well known as a as a player, but um, his legacy, then his his family and and the music of Finbar and the, the Fury family. You know, we 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 can we all know how how important that was to popularise traditional music in the 1970s. Um, Finbar's piping has always been a great interest and uh, inspiration to me. It's it's wonderful to see him playing, and we can see that just that family legacy passed on through Ted on to his sons. It's it's, it's fabulous to see. Yeah. No, I never will forget him He made me what I am He may be gone, memories linger And I, and I miss him He lived a great life, you know. He enjoyed every minute of it with the music. He made great, great friends, and he, you know, in this world, and he had great time for everybody. Finbar's passionate love and gratitude for his parents' gift of music to him and his brothers Eddie, Paul and George is evident in Finbar's composition I remember you singing this song, Ma. I remember the day my mother passed on My father had gone just why. I sat in the church and I listened to all From a distance I heard this old song Did you, Was your mother a believer? Oh yeah, my mother went to Mass all every Sunday, she wouldn't miss it, you know mm. She would go on, you know, both of them, would, if they were together, they would go together, you know I wonder if he's teasing you now. I wonder if he's holding your hand. Love has a way of never letting go. Should I know you're together? Let's leave the final word to Ted. Lauren Quinn and Thurum Malam. Those are minuets composed by O'Carlin or Waltz, if you like. <laughs>